It's time to talk about June's Journey, a hidden object mystery game with a captivating detective story. When you're playing, you solve a mind-teasing mystery of the roaring 1920s while you dive into June's captivating quest to uncover a scandalous family secret and solve her sister's murder. It's mystery, it's danger, and it's romance, and you never know where the next chapter's gonna take you. If that wasn't fun enough, you get to customize your very own luxurious island estate. Seriously, I cannot stop playing. I am already on the third chapter, and I just started recently. Join me back in time in the glamorous 1920s. June needs your help, detective. Download June's Journey for free today on iOS and Android. You wanted to see me, Miss Swinton? Have you been hearing about the new government modernization efforts? AI, RPAs, data science. Things are changing at this agency, and people will need new skills. Oh. I'd like you to get some training. Huh. Look at this management concepts catalog. Wow, over 275 courses. That's right, in local classrooms or instructor-led online classes. We still have budget in this fiscal year, so sign up online. Advance your career with courses from Management Concepts. Get a catalog at managementconcepts.com or call 833-578-8466. This podcast may discuss topics graphic in nature and possibly triggering to survivors. We value the safety and well-being of all of our listeners, so please practice personal discretion. Now, enjoy the show. Hey, I'm Paige. And I'm Natalie. We're the hosts of the Murder Diaries podcast. We bonded over tacos and true crime after we matched on Bumble BFF. You know, like any normal millennial using an app to meet new friends. Every Thursday, we upload a new episode. In each episode of The Murder Diaries, we tell true crime one story at a time. One week, it's my turn. And the next week, it's mine. You still think it's in my head, but I'm walking with the dead. This week, we are bringing you another case that comes from the vault, if you will. When we first started recording, we had a bunch of cases that we got ready and kind of recorded and just started the Murder Diaries with. Many of you that have been listening since the beginning know that we have grown a lot. And those of you that have just joined us more recently or within the last year, You guys may have seen a little bit of growth too, but when I tell you that I could not wait to dive back into this case and I want to say do it right, like get back into the notes and do it the way that Natalie and I know how to do it now and do it that justice now. Like Paige was saying, as we've been doing the murder diaries, now we're going on two, two and a half years, we've really developed our own voice and how we want to tell these stories and respect and honor these victims. By doing that, we realize that it's our duty as podcasters in this community to redo some of those earlier episodes and give these victims back their voices. And that's what we're going to do. Absolutely. And over this last year and a half that we have really found our voice in this industry, listeners and families of the victims and loved ones involved with the victims have responded positively. So we want to, we want to do that with some of these older episodes. Um, so you might be hearing some of them kind of sprinkled in here and there. I know we did one a while back as well. So that being said, today's vault case is coming from 1993 and it is the case of Polly class out of Petaluma, California. Polly Hannah class was born January 23rd, 1981, in Fairfax, California. In 1993, she was living in Petaluma, California, with her half-sister Annie and her mom, Eve. Polly actually shared this half-sister Annie with her friend, Jess. Jess's dad and Polly's mom met when Jess and Polly were about three years old, and they used to play together on the playground, and they were little friends. Around three years later, that's when the half-sister Annie was born, and they were kind of like a blended family unit, like a modern blended family. According to an op-ed that was written by Jess, which is linked in the show notes, uh, they were a tight-knit family at that. In the fall of 1993, Polly was 12 years old and was 
doing what 12-year-old girls do, enjoying time with friends, and she wanted to be an actress when she grew up. Unfortunately, Polly's dreams would be cut short on the night of October 1st, 1993. It was a Friday night, and 12-year-old Polly was getting ready for a sleepover with friends. First to arrive was Jillian, and they hung out at Polly's house and waited for their friend Kate. The three, of course, were going to be supervised by Polly's mom. She was going to be home while the girls had some fun. And most of us 80s babies, 90s kids can attest to how fun sleepovers like this were with like your best friends, you and your couple of best friends sleeping over, eating popcorn, staying up late, watching movies, telling scary stories, eating ice cream, all the junk and just having a blast. I definitely had my fair share of those type of 90s kids sleepovers. And you can definitely attest, Natalie, that these sleepovers, they can get a little rowdy, get a little loud, you're giggling, maybe doing some prank calls, laughing, just having overall fun and not really noticing your volume, right? Absolutely. Well, that's definitely the case on this night for Jillian, Kate, and Polly. And around 9.45, Polly's mom, Eve, checked in on the girls and asked them to keep it down and was, in a sense, also kind of saying goodnight to the girls, letting them know I'm heading to bed. The reason for this is that, of course, it's a Friday night. So as adults now, we understand that Friday's after a work day or what have you, we get tired. But also, on top of that, Polly's mom suffered from migraines. And As a fellow migraine sufferer, I can tell you when you've got one and you want to just take your Excedrin or whatever and go to bed, it's time to do that, right? So Polly's mom says goodnight, keep it down to the girls and retires to her bedroom where she was going to call it a night. She took some prescribed sleeping pills and went to bed. She knew the girls were going to be enjoying themselves and would probably have a hard time keeping it down. And so that's how she knew, you know what, I'm probably going to need one of these sleeping pills that I have prescribed to me tonight. Eve was not wrong. The girls stayed up and they continued to have fun. And part of that fun was practicing Halloween makeup for the upcoming holiday. Around 1030 or so, the girls decided it was time to get the sleeping bags and to be able to set some of that stuff up. Polly opens the bedroom door to go get the sleeping bags and a man was in the doorway with a knife. Polly's friends thought it may have been a Halloween joke, just the way it turned out and the time of year it was. And this also just shows a little bit of their innocence, of course, too. They quickly realized, though, that it was not a joke. Polly was clearly terrified and had not set this prank up. The intruder enters the bedroom and tied all three girls up with their hands behind their back um, using electrical cords and some type of cloth. The band was assuring the girls that, look, I'm not going to hurt any of you, but I want money. And this, to me, is such a sickening lie because it's so manipulative because you don't get money from little girls. No, he clearly wasn't there for money. And as an adult, hearing this story, you know that Like you said, it's a sickening lie. If you have little girls, please teach them that adults, especially adult men, are not going to need to borrow money from you or need your help for anything. Back to what's going on in Polly's room. The intruder put pillowcases over the girls' heads and he duct taped their mouths. He asked Jill and Kate, to count to a thousand, and he took Polly with him. The intruder tells the girls that, done counting to 1,000, that Polly would be back with them. He's just going to take her for a short moment, and by the time they're done, she'll be back, and it will all be over. This doesn't happen, though. About 20 minutes or so later, Jill and Kate had managed to free themselves, but Polly was nowhere to be found, not in the house, not in the bedroom couldn't find her. Once they realize that they couldn't find Polly anywhere, Jill and Kate know that they need to wake up Eve, Polly's mom, and let her know right away. Polly's missing. This guy came into the house and he took her. Eve mentions that it was a little bit of a rough wake up, you know, with the sleeping pills. She's kind of groggy trying to figure out what was going on. But 
when she does come to and understands what was going on that Polly's missing, uh, she calls 911, the Petaluma police, um, and they responded quickly. When police entered the house and take a look at the bedroom, they realized that something bad had definitely happened. They found strips of cloth on the floor that were cut as if they would be used for binding, tying around a wrist, which is exactly part of what had bound the wrists of the girls. They also found Nintendo controllers on the floor with the cords cut, and that is potentially the electric cord that was used to tie the girls up as well. They also found a strap that would normally be clipped onto a purse, kind of like a removable purse strap. They found that on the floor. And they also found pillowcases sort of scattered about, um, specifically the ones that were used to put over Jill and Kate's heads. As expected, law enforcement gathered the evidence and it ended up being just a few bags of evidence. But they also decide, hey, on top of these few bags of evidence, let's take the rug from this room as well. It was actually more of an intuitive move, or at least as it's explained in the interview of the documentary I watched, which is also linked in the show notes. The FBI gets involved just after midnight. The documentary I watched explains that it's the class family that reached out, but they also go on to explain that it's very typical for FBI to be working a kidnapping case like this. The lead investigator of the case became Special Agent Ed Fryer. To him and his years of experience with kidnapping cases, Polly's case had all the signs of a stranger abduction case. Unfortunately, these cases are harder to crack, especially back then. And the reasoning for this is explained in the documentary as well, that there's nothing to connect the victim to the perpetrator, and it's seemingly a random act. So there's nothing to connect the victim to the perpetrator besides this act. So you only have the evidence to go off of. So you have to use evidence to tie that perpetrator to the victim. And with it being a seemingly random act, those involved in the victim's lives may have no clue or no idea that it happened or would have been about to happen at the time. That makes sense. I mean, with 7 billion people in the world, it literally could be anyone. And that's why I think it's so great that the FBI was able to get right in and start working on this case along with local law enforcement. Yeah, the FBI worked hard and fast because time was of the essence. It should be noted as well that Jill and Kate were consistent in their stories of what happened that night. They also gave descriptions of the perpetrator and aided in a sketch being created of the perpetrator. Now we're at 4 a.m. and the girls are taken to the police station and the FBI Special Task Force Evidence Response Team is called in. That's a lot to ask of 12-year-olds who've just experienced such a traumatic event in their life. Think about it. It's 4 a.m. and they're still up and they're now going to the police station after creating this sketch and all of that. Like, this is crazy. Especially after the trauma that they just endured. They were bound by a stranger wielding a knife and their friend was taken. I, I can't imagine what these poor girls had to go through. So the fact that they were able to give these stories and give a description of this offender is incredible. And I applaud them for their bravery. I'm sure it was no easy feat but I'm also sure that they wanted to find their friend just as much as everybody else involved. The FBI being one of those involved that wanted to find Polly. So they bring in their special task force that's called the Evidence Response Team. This task force is responsible for providing forensic technological equipment that aids in gathering more evidence at a crime scene. So first responders arrive and they gather the big evidence, right? The pillowcases, the cloths and the cords that were used to bind the girls' wrists, that type of evidence. Then this type of task force, the evidence response team comes in and they use special forensic technology that's going to allow them to find the stuff that maybe the naked eye doesn't see. The more minute details. The more minute details, exactly. For example... Police had fingerprinted at the scene, but they didn't get anything. When the evidence response team went over the scene, 
they were able to use something called alternate light source technology. And they found four dozen fingerprints at the scene. And they also found a palm print. The palm print was on Polly's bedpost. Alternate light source technology uses fluorescent powder to dust for the prints and then uses ultraviolet light in conjunction with amber colored goggles to see prints better. As I mentioned, they found about four dozen prints. Many of those ended up being attributed to family and Polly, but the palm print was not. And luckily to alternate light source technology, it was found and they saved what they could of it in order to help them identify the perpetrator later. It's also important to remember that the print database, Avis, did not store palm prints at the time. The hunt to find the suspect and Polly was on and it was tireless. By dawn on October 2nd, over 100 FBI agents and police officers had begun to search and investigate around the neighborhood. Helicopters and canines were all on duty and an all points bulletin was distributed by local authorities and the FBI. Agents took to Polly's school where they spoke with students and teachers in effort to find out anything that might help them find out where Polly was and who this kidnapper might be. They also canvassed the neighborhood. They went to every house to try and find information as well. This particular move brought them in a new lead. Several neighbors recall seeing a stranger around the neighborhood that fits the description that Jill and Kate had given on that day. The lead I mentioned, however, came from a boy named Thomas who lived in the neighborhood. On the night of Polly's abduction, Thomas was with a few friends walking to the video store around 9 p.m. And on this walk to the video store, he and his friends saw a man lurking in the shadows on the side of Polly's house. On their way back from the video store, they noticed the man was still there. The description that Thomas gave of the man that he saw that night matched the sketch that was created from Jill and Kate's description. Another young man named Sean says he was playing video games with some friends in a rental cottage that is directly behind Polly's house. It's not connected to Polly's family or Polly's house, but it is a rental cottage of a separate property that you can see Polly's house from. It was about 10.30 and he happened to look out the window and see a strange man on the back porch of Polly's house. So you can see that the cottage was situated behind from the back of Polly's house. Sean also gave a description of this man and it too matched the description that Thomas, Jill, and Kate have all given. This part of Polly's story always gives me the chills because just hearing that the offender stood outside her home for at least an hour and a half is truly ominous. The FBI feels the same and they pressed on and on. They ruled out family and friends. They continued local efforts. But before too long, they started looking a little bit more outward into surrounding areas. And they started looking at registered sex offenders in those surrounding areas. The search for Polly turns into the largest in the nation's history at that time. The internet was also used to spread her missing persons poster, which in 1993 is a pretty big deal. Oh, it's in its infancy. The internet was definitely in its infancy in terms of being able to reach people in their homes. In 1993, people had really just started getting computers in their house that they might use the internet on and see Polly's missing poster. As the case pressed on, back at the lab, a forensic expert, Chris Allen, was reviewing the evidence from the crime scene. And he ascertained that the strips of cloth that were used to bind Jill and Kate's hands were originally all from the same piece of cloth, meaning that there was a piece of cloth that was once whole and it was ripped into the strips that were then used to tie the girls at the wrist. The material, as it's explained, is one that many of us 80s babies, 90s kids know. And it's that material that they use to make nightgowns. It's that stretchy pajama nightgown material that's often used to make children's nightgowns specifically. You know, the ones that usually have princesses or whatever on them. Remember I mentioned that they had a bit of an intuition that they needed to take the rug with them. Well, it's a good thing they did 
because they ended up finding fibers in that rug that were most likely from the abductor's car. A hair was also found on the rug from Polly's room. This hair was not your normal hair that just shed out of someone's head. This hair had a three or four millimeter piece of scalp material still attached. To investigators, this indicated that it actually might have been pulled out during a struggle as he kidnapped Polly. Unfortunately, in 1993, there wasn't too much they could do with it because the DNA testing just was not there yet. The palm print from the bedpost that I mentioned earlier was sent to one of the FBI's fingerprint specialists. The fingerprint specialist analyzed it and... They look at it under laser light. With that, they discovered that it's a pretty strong print with lots of defined detail. So they decided to take a picture of it and scan it. When they did so, the light from the laser turned the print orange and the background, I guess, a little too dark. It took some work, but they got the print to be black and the background to be white. This was important because in order to use this as official evidence, it has to be black print, white background, at least at the time. And that's just further evidence of how new all of this technology was at this time. Duke's mail. Do you get it? Because only the ones that get it really get it. Your friends get it. Your mom gets it. Your grandma gets it. Your neighbors get it. Sometimes a dog gets it. Get out of there. What else? Uh, Your potato salads get it. BLTs get it, tailgates get it, and restaurants get it too. By now, even you probably get it. So get it today. Made without any sugar since 1917, Dukes is that little southern something that makes good things better. Get Dukes. It's got twang. Allergy season is just around the corner, and Brio, the innovative air purifier, can help. Brio quickly removes common allergens, including pollen and pet dander, and deep cleans without filter clogging, so it's more effective than HEPA. Brio's long-life filters save you money too. Breathe easy this spring with Brio, the advanced air purifier that's ideal for every room in your home. And get 15% off Brio using code IHEART at BrioAirPurifier.com. That's code IHEART at B-R-I-O AirPurifier.com. While this new technology is being used and the evidence is being examined, Polyclass's family is still without their daughter and their sister. Two days after she was kidnapped, her dad, Mark, gets a phone call. The voice on the other end says, it's me, dad, Polly. I'm in a hotel room and the abductor stepped away for a second. So essentially saying they stepped away, I can call you, let you know, I'm alive, I'm okay. But as soon as she said the abductor stepped away for a second, the call went dead. Mark's phone was not set up for tracing or anything yet. So all they could do is set it up for tracing and wait for another call. This was a huge glimmer of hope in the case that she might still be alive. Search efforts continue while they wait for that second call. In the two days since she'd gone missing, 50,000 missing flyers with Polly's picture were distributed. Also operational was a 24-hour call center that was available to field tips and worked in conjunction with the FBI and the Petaluma police. From that call center, over 12,000 leads were garnered. The lead that they were most interested in, though, was that phone call Mark had received. They wanted that second call to come in. And as I mentioned, they got ready for it. Well, the second call came in. It wasn't a long call, but it was long enough for them to trace where it was coming from. The trace led them to a house about 30 miles away. Law enforcement made entry to the home, but there was no Polly. All they found was a typical family scene. Finally, the teenage daughter of the family fessed up and said that she was dared at school to do it. The dream that Polly might have been alive was smashed. In mid-October, Jill and Kate go back in to help make a second sketch with a new, highly acclaimed sketch artist. This is important because not as much immediate emotion is surrounding them. They have processed and seeked help for their relation to the trauma and they could concentrate more to help find their friend and get a fresh new sketch out there. This is when another strange thing like that random teenage girl being dared to call happens. 
authorities receive a call for ransom. This is just after a reward had been put out for Polly's safe return. The call ended up being traced to a random apartment in Petaluma. Law enforcement make entry to the apartment, and all they find is a 20-year-old man. No Polly, no sign of Polly. This man was not who they were looking for. He was not the abductor. However, he did end up being arrested and charged with attempted extortion and posing as the abductor. It's unfortunate to say, but this was another huge emotional blow for this case and a gross show of human behavior. Twice now. On October 17th, Polly's family published a letter to her abductor in the San Francisco Chronicle. In the letter, the family pleased with the kidnapper. Wherever you are, whoever you are, please return Polly to her family. She belongs here. We miss Polly so much. We miss the twinkle in her eye and her sweet humor. We long to see her beautiful smile and hear her musical voice. They also write to Polly and say, Our darling, if you can read this, please know that mommy and daddy love you so much and we will continue to search for you until we can hold you in our loving arms again. You can see the emotion around this case and the FBI is not immune to that. They want to find Polly and they refuse to lose hope. And so does her family. Honestly, this case touched families across the country. And with that, the search for Polly was supported nationwide. Banners were put up everywhere. Candlelight vigils were organized and many Americans wore lavender ribbons, which was Polly's favorite color. Time passes on. Halloween comes and goes. Thanksgiving comes and goes. And on November 28th, 1993, a woman in Sonoma County named Dana Jaffe calls authorities. This woman lives, as I mentioned, in Sonoma County at the end of a long, winding drive. Dana had quite the piece of property, and with owning property, you have to inspect it sometimes. You got to drive around, see what's going on with your property. Well, Dana was doing just that one day, and that's when she says she found a piece of silk cloth, tights, and packing tape in one of the wooded areas of her property, which was just off the long drive that I mentioned that led to her home. The cloth was fashioned into like a hood type garment and the tights were tied into a knot and had a piece of hair that they found inside of the knot. Authorities noticed pretty quickly that the material that had been fashioned into a hood type garment looked a lot like the material that was used to bind the girls during the abduction. Dana is so incredibly pivotal in this case. Not only did she find those strange items and not just throw them out, she knew that she needed to call authorities and alert them. She also recalled a night about two months prior. And on this night, her babysitter, Shannon, was leaving and noticed a man at the end of the drive. And she describes him as looking like a wild man. Is your daily grind getting you down? A Thermospas hot tub may be the solution. Just a few minutes under those powerful, soothing jets, and all your stress seems to melt away, like you're lying on a cloud of bubbles. You'll not only feel better, but sleep better, too. Call 877-861-4672 now. And for a limited time, save $1,250. Call 877-861-4672 or visit thermospas.com to schedule a free on-site assessment. She asked him if he needed help from a cracked window and he insisted, yes, my car is stuck and please get out and help me. Well, she refused to assist because of politeness and stay safe, as we say. Uh, This is a quick reminder for the ladies. Just like when I was talking about with kids, men will never ask you for help with any laborious task like getting the car unstuck. They just won't and they don't. So don't do it. If you want to help them, get out of the situation and call help for them. And I think that that's what Shannon was trying to do as well. But mostly she wanted to get out of that situation and call Dana to let her know that this strange man was at the end of her drive. And that's just what she did. She called Dana the second she could from a payphone, which was about two miles down the road. When Dana hears that there's a strange man at the end of the drive, she grabs her daughter along with a bat. 
and gets in her car and drives down to find the man. Dana doesn't find the man, but she does notice the car that had been stuck. Dana then drives straight to the police station and notifies police. Just after midnight, law enforcement arrived to where the man had gotten his car stuck. This time, they find him with the car, and he appeared agitated, sweaty, a little dirty. He had leaves in his hair. He looked like a wild man, just like Shannon says. On that night, two months prior, Dana said she didn't want to press charges against him, but she did just want him off her property. Just get him off my property, please. The man tells police that he was just sightseeing and he didn't know that this was private property and I got stuck when I tried to turn around. In terms of why he had leaves in his hair and was looking a little scuffed up and dirty, he said that he was underneath his car trying to fix it. But this is a red flag to the deputies because the way his car was stuck, they recall that there wasn't enough room for anyone to get underneath it. Deputies take a look at the car and they find beer and they also find a duffel bag on the back seat. They asked him if he had been drinking that night in which he proceeded to open up one of the cans of beer and drink it right in front of them. Of course, they stop him and tell him he needs to pour it out. Besides this strange behavior and the scene just being off, there wasn't much deputies could do because he passed the sobriety tests that they administer. They pat him down. They question him some more. They find nothing further incriminating. They run his license. Nothing comes up. All they could do was help him get his car unstuck and let him go. So 45 minutes later, they let him go. They couldn't find any warrants and they basically had to let him go. The night that Dana's referring to As about two months earlier, you guessed it, it was October 1st, 1993, the same night Polly was abducted. With this new insight and the cloth appearing to be similar to that used at the scene of the kidnapping, the FBI get all the information from the police about what had happened on October 1st on Dana's property, as I just described. They discover that the man that was on Dana's property that night, the one who may have been the one that left the cloth that appears to possibly match the cloth from Polly's bedroom that night, was a man named Richard Allen Davis. Naturally, they take a look at Richard Allen Davis's file. They find quite the history. In 1976, he had been arrested for robbery, kidnapping, and assault with intent to rape. In 1978, he was arrested for kidnapping, assault with a weapon, and some other charges. And they also find out that he had recently been paroled from an eight-year sentence for kidnapping. On top of all this, the photo in his file matched the description of Polly's abductor that had been given by Thomas, by Sean, by Jillian, by Kate. He matched. The forensic analyst on the case, Chris Allen, who had compared the cloth originally and discovered it was once one cloth, takes a look at the cloth found in the woods. And he discovers that the pieces all match perfectly. They fit together like a puzzle along the cut or torn lines. This proves that the cloth from the woods and the cloth from Polly's bedroom were once the same piece of cloth. And more importantly, it meant that this guy may have had something to do with Polly's disappearance. Despite officers making this connection of Richard Allen Davis to Polly's disappearance, it didn't have enough to legally get him right away. They decided that their best course of action was going to be to get him in custody somehow for something else and hope for some kind of confession. They ended up finding a warrant that was out on Richard Allen Davis for breaking parole and a DUI. So they decide we're going to bring him in. They go to his house. And when they arrived, he wasn't there. The FBI made sure to secure the area while they were looking for him and while they were about to go grab him. During this time, a deputy in the area pulled him over in his creepy van and noticed, oh my gosh, this is Richard Allen Davis. Figuring out who he had just pulled over, he notified the FBI and they arrived straight from attempting to pick him up at his house to the location where he'd been pulled over. They arrest him for the parole violation. The arrest was a pretty low-key event, and 
that actually started a bit of a good cop rapport with the arresting agent and Richard Allen Davis. And this report was built in hopes that it would lead to maybe a confession when they interrogate him about Holly's disappearance. So now they have him in custody and Jillian and Kate are brought in to participate in identifying him in your traditional police lineup. To the girls, there was no question which of the guys in the lineup was Richard. With him being identified in that lineup, this gave investigators what they needed to be able to question him about Polly's disappearance. And they do that. Of course, during questioning, Richard lied and claimed in a sense that he didn't have anything to do with Polly's disappearance. And in fact, he didn't really want to talk about Polly's case at all. It was pretty dismissive. Investigators know, though, that they've got some of that forensic evidence, like the palm print from Polly's bedpost. So they decide, let's take a palm print of Richard. So they do that. And upon examination, the palm print matched the palm print from Polly's bedpost. Lead agent, Agent Fryer, recalls butterflies in his stomach when he heard the news on the phone. Agent Fryer was at the command post at the time, and he hung up the phone and announced the news to the entire command post. Agent Fryer recalls the room lighting up with this new movement in Polly's case. Papers were flying. People were cheering. It was a very exciting moment that they got their guy. Remember, this whole time, Richard is still claiming innocence, that he has nothing to do with Polly's disappearance. He is, however, still, of course, in custody. And with that, his phone calls are being recorded. And in one of these phone call recordings, his friend can be heard urging him to come clean and tell them where Polly was. On that phone call, he basically says, you don't know what you're talking about, dude, and claims innocence knowing that he's probably being recorded. But then the friend goes further and says, dude, there's an article out there about your palm print matching a palm print from the scene. You're caught. This is the moment where Richard decides to come clean. And about four days later, he does so. And if you think about it, how else would he explain that his palm print was in Polly's room? I mean, the guy was caught, really. Richard says that at the time of Polly's disappearance, he was living in a halfway house. He says on the night of her disappearance, he was drunk and trying to find his mom's house. And that's when he ended up in Polly's neighborhood, walking around aimlessly. It's obvious, though, to investigators that he knew he wanted to commit a crime because he was prepared with the pre-cut cloth and the tape and those actions, having those items definitely showed intent. Richard goes on to tell detectives that He chose Polly at random, and he got into her house through an open window. Richard also mentions that he was high along with being drunk, and that once he came out of his intoxication, he was shocked to find that he had Polly in his car. He said that Polly was crying and said that her wrists were going numb. At this point, Richard says that he didn't know what to do, and he just sort of drove around while he figured out what he was going to do. It's during this sort of aimless driving around that Richard says he ends up driving the car off the main road and getting stuck at Dana Jaffe's property. He says it's at this time he realized that he couldn't get the car unstuck on his own and would need help. In order to get help, he would have to get Polly away from the scene. And to do so, he took her up an embankment that was about 30 yards away while he got help and or freed the car. The rest of what Richard tells law enforcement actually matches what Shannon and Dana described to officers. It's discovered that on the night of Polly's kidnapping, while officers were on Dana's property for those 45 minutes with him, they weren't tuned to the right frequency that was used to denounce Polly as a missing person. What's more is when they ran Richard's license, they only had equipment with them that checked his driving records, not his criminal record. So all those items from the 70s and 80s that he had on there, they would have never seen them with the equipment that they had on them that night. Richard recalls that deputies helped him pull his car out from where it had been stuck. And he says he waited about 15, 20 minutes. And then that's when he went back up the embankment to get Polly. He admits that it was then that he decided to murder her. It's with this admission that investigators knew that Polly was definitely murdered. 
Richard led them to the murder site, which was in a deserted area in Cloverdale, California. It was night when they went to the site, but investigators were not going to lose their chance to get Polly. The site in Cloverdale was about 50 miles north of Petaluma. It was basically a field near an abandoned lumber mill. It's here in that field that Polly's body was laying in a shallow grave beneath some boards. The cause of death was deemed strangulation. Richard claims that Polly was still alive and untied while he was detained by the police earlier, right? He says, oh, I waited till they were gone and then I went up to go get her after about 15, 20 minutes. And he grossly says, I can't believe she didn't scream. And he's just kind of a crass dude, honestly. And then he also goes on to assure them that he doesn't blame the officer. Of course not, because the blame's always going to be on him. His trial started in 1996. This guy is so gross and taunted Polly's father when he addressed the family at the trial. He tells the courtroom that when he abducted Polly, she told him, just don't do me like my dad, insinuating that Mark sexually assaulted his daughter. He then goes on to tell her dad, I have to pay my dues and so should you. Again, insinuating that Mark should pay for this fictitious sexual assault that he's making up. It's just disgusting. It's worse than salt in the wound. When that happened, Mark was rightfully enraged and he actually left the courtroom. Richard Allen Davis was found guilty on June 18th, 1996 by the jury. And he was found guilty on 10 counts, including kidnapping, robbery, murder, and attempting to commit a lewd act. The lewd act is the one thing that Richard Allen Davis continued to deny. And I also want to note that despite Richard saying, yeah, I had her up on that embankment the whole time that police officers were there, she was still alive. Well, investigators believe that she was already dead at the time that they were at his car with him. Richard Allen Davis was sentenced to death at his sentencing. And to this day, he sits on death row at San Quentin. Many of us in the true crime community know that Polly has left quite a legacy. Her case changed how missing persons cases are handled forever. All law enforcement databases are now linked across agencies. Missing person bulletins are now sent over all police channels. That way, no matter what frequency the police are tuned to, they're going to hear the missing persons bulletin. During routine traffic stops, officers can now access not just driving records like they did that night with Richard Allen Davis, but also criminal records. California's three strikes rule was also a direct result of this case. This three strike rule means that you get 25 years minimum in prison if you have three felonies. Class Kids Foundation lives on in Polly's name. The Polly Hanna Class Performing Arts Center is standing in Petaluma. It's currently been closed since year 2000, And unfortunately, that's due to funding, but there is some new renovation that's going on. It started in May of this year, 2021, and this is bringing hope of a reopening soon. Actress Winona Ryder, a Petaluma native, dedicated her performance in Little Women to Polly. Little Women, the 90s version, is my absolute favorite movie of all time. So this is so touching to me, and I love this so much. It should also be noted that Winona put out a $200,000 reward for Polly's safe return at the time she was missing. Polly's father, Mark, founded Class Kids, as I mentioned. In 1994, he started this foundation and dedicated it to recovering missing children and putting public policies in place. This is the foundation that was involved in things like the Three Strikes Law, President Clinton's crime bill, Megan's law, Amber Alerts, and other various child safety legislation. So Class Kids Foundation definitely had a hand in a lot of these important pieces of legislation that we know so well in the true crime community today. Incredibly, over 4,000 people helped in the search for Polly. Polly was laid to rest in the form of her ashes being spread at sea in the Pacific Ocean. Not far from where her ashes were spread, a public bench stands in Polly's honor at 719 Ocean View Boulevard in Pacific Grove, California. 
This is basically the Monterey area. It's kind of central coast to Northern California. And you can actually Google Earth and see the bench a little bit. It's kind of off in the distance, but you all know by now that I love to Google Earth certain things. And um, I've seen a picture of the bench just from the resources um, in an article, but I wanted to see if you could see it on Google Earth and you definitely can. So if you Google Earth 719 Ocean View Boulevard in Pacific Grove, California, on the ocean side of the street, you will see a bench and that is Polly's Bench. It's green and it says her name on it, I believe in yellow. On October 1st, 2018, 25 years after her murder, a 30-person event of remembrance was held by Polly's father at the site of that bench. I know for me, being a California native, every time I'm dipping my toes in the Pacific Ocean, I will definitely be thinking of Polly now. And that's where we'll leave this episode for this week. Until our next episode, you know where to find us at the Murder Diaries Podcast.com, at the Murder Diaries Pod at gmail.com, and the Murder Diaries Pod on Instagram. We also have a TikTok now, so go and find us there at the Murder Diaries Pod. Check us out. And until then, stay safe. Bye. Bye. Is your daily grind getting you down? A Thermospas hot tub may be the solution. Just a few minutes under those powerful soothing jets and all your stress seems to melt away like you're lying on a cloud of bubbles. You'll not only feel better, but sleep better too. Call 877-861-4672 now. And for a limited time, save $1,250. Call 877-861-4672 or visit thermospas.com to schedule a free on-site assessment. Seeking the truth never gets old. Introducing June's Journey, the free-to-play mobile game that will immerse you in a thrilling murder mystery. Join June Parker as she uncovers hidden objects and clues to solve her sister's death in a beautifully illustrated world set in the roaring 20s. With new chapters added every week, the excitement never ends. Download June's Journey now on your Android or iOS device or play on PC through Facebook games.